Uh, I'm Paul Webley. I'm the director of SOAS. I'd like to welcome all of you in the audience tonight, particularly all of those who've travelled a long way to be here, and to Professor Richard Reed's friends and colleagues. We've got guests from all over the place tonight. Some people have travelled a long way to be here. And we're very grateful to you all. Um, SOAS inaugurals are rather special, and I say that having been at other universities where all inaugurals seem to me to get less and less special with the years, uh, kind of downgraded in importance, uh, optional, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that SOAS inaugurals have a real sense of occasion, they're a celebration, they're a rite de passage uh, for the speaker. Richard assures me that he has no nerves at all. Uh, and an enjoyable intellectual event for the whole SOAS community. It's also uh, a great pleasure to welcome Richard's mother, wife, and brother. I don't know where they are in the audience, but I'm told they're here somewhere. So, welcome. And um, Richard told me that uh, his mother has never heard him give a lecture. This will be great. I can assure you it'll be a wonderful occasion. Now, just to make sure it's a wonderful occasion, uh, can I just do a bit of simple housekeeping? First thing is, do turn off your mobile phones. So, mobile phones first. Turn off your stupid mobile phone. Okay. Good. I think people who see me do these inaugurals frequently think I'm extremely stupid because it takes me a long time to turn off my mobile phone. Uh, the other thing is, if there's a fire alarm, it means there's a fire. Uh, don't panic, note where the fire exits are. Now, I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the second one of the 2013-14 inaugural lecture series. I think it's particularly appropriate that uh, Richard is giving his inaugural this term. It coincides with the brilliant exhibition on David Livingstone, for which he was the lead academic. If you've not seen it, please make sure you go in and look at it. It is really excellent. The reason I say you, you might have to make an effort because it's not immediately obvious when you go through the Zoroastrian exhibition that there is actually a brilliant Livingstone exhibition to see as well. So if you haven't seen it, please go. It's really, really good. Now, Professor Reid will be introduced by Professor Justin Willis, who's a professor in the Department of History at Durham University. His work has largely been concerned with identity, authority, and social change in Eastern Africa over the last 200 years. And he's conducted extensive archival and oral historical research in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Sudan. He's also held research awards from the ESRC, AHRC, Leverhulme Trust. It's all very impressive. Professor Will's current research particularly rates the history of elections in Eastern Africa since the 1950s. And from 2006 to 2009, he was seconded from Durham to serve as director of the British Institute in Eastern Africa in Nairobi. The vote of thanks will be delivered by Dr. John Parker of the Department of History here at SOAS. And so he really needs no introduction, but you'll get a couple of sentences, John. Uh, John's a senior lecturer in the history of Africa here. He's the author of Making the Town, Gar State and Society in Early Colonial Accra, Tong Nab, The History of a West African God, and African History, A Very Short Introduction, which I've read, so I know it's very good. Uh, he's recently researched a book on the history of death and burial in Ghana. He's edited, edited the Oxford Handbook of Modern African History with Richard. We're very grateful to both of you uh, for being part of today's events, and I'll pass over to uh, Professor Willis in a moment. At the end, notice that you'll also be invited upstairs to the Brunei Suite for some wine and food. So, over to you, Professor Willis. Good evening, everyone. Um, I can't remember when I first met Richard Reed, uh, which is quite surprising to me because he has come to loom quite large in my life subsequently. But my first memory relating to Richard is sitting on the top deck of a number 29 bus reading a seminar paper by him, I think in 1995, at a time when I was a temporary lecturer here trying not very adequately to fill the shoes of Andrew Roberts, who had been my own supervisor and was Richard's at this time. And although I don't remember reading, meeting Richard, I do remember reading his seminar paper, and I do remember being impressed at the time by his determination to study pre-colonial African history at a time when so many, including myself, were being tempted to study the more recent past by the relative ease and convenience of doing so. 
I then lost touch with Richard for some years. Um, I was in East Africa. Uh, Richard also was, but in a different part. He went off to Eritrea to enjoy what, in retrospect, we can see as the all-too-brief Eritrean political and intellectual spring of the mid to late 1990s. And I think it's probably fair to say, Richard can correct me if I'm wrong, that it was at this time that Richard really developed some of the characteristics of his subsequent work. And I think it's fair to say that his work has really been marked both by an extraordinarily broad regional sweep of interests, but also by a real interest in a chronological depth, but yet again also in a willingness to think about the very recent past and understanding contemporary Africa in terms of that deep past. And I think Richard's experience in Eritrea helped him to think about all of these things in a very profound and sometimes quite intense way. Richard reappeared in my life in a quite a major way in 2002, I think it was, when he came to join me at Durham as a lecturer in African history. I really hadn't been keeping in contact with his work or with him over the years, and so I had no idea what to expect when he appeared. And I have to say it was an extraordinarily pleasant surprise, and from the day of his arrival, I was delighted that he had come to join me at Durham. That was partly, of course, because Richard is quite simply immensely good company. He's a very sociable person. He's very entertaining to be with. It took him a little while to adjust to the hard drinking culture of the Northeast. <laughs> but after the first couple of minutes, he seemed to get the hang of it. And thereafter, he was, it's safe to say, the life of the party for myself and for other colleagues and also often for our postgraduate students. And he played a tremendous role socially, which should never be underestimated in any institution. But he was also an extraordinarily hard worker at a time when we faced extremely heavy workloads in Durham. He was thoroughly committed to teaching. And we are, if I can blow the Durham trumpet for a moment, a department which prides itself on its teaching of undergraduates. We have a very... Uh, distinctive, competitive, and demanding group of undergraduates. And Richard rose to the task of teaching those students with extraordinary calm and aplomb, and also sometimes with vigor and energy. And he was great to work with, really an excellent colleague. And last but not least, uh, Richard was marvelous to work with because of the candor and clarity which he brought to any intellectual discussion. He was really a good person to talk about work with, not only because he was sympathetic and entertaining and clever, but, but also because he was willing to say things which sometimes people weren't always willing to hear or willing to think about. This quality, I think, his candor and his directness has consistently marked Richard's published work. A, a not altogether friendly reviewer remarked of his uh, Frontiers of Warfare book in a review on the unusual, if contentious, approach of the book and on Richard's erudite and provocative style. Now, I don't think that Richard would quibble with any of those adjectives, although he may well have found reason to disagree with much of the rest of the content of that particular review. As John Rowe noted in his sleeve notes on Richard's first book, Political Power in Pre-Colonial Buganda, Richard takes no prisoners in his academic writing. It is, of course, a very apposite metaphor, since from the outset, Richard has been concerned in his study with the theme of violence, and particularly the relationship of violence to state power in Eastern Africa and across Africa more widely. The choice of topic in itself is revealing of Richard's great virtue of directness and robustness. Many Africanist historians, I think it's safe to say, have shied away from the topic of violence and warfare in African history, partly because we're a liberal lefty sort of lot and we hate bloodshed, but also, of course, because the shadow of Hugh Trevor Roper has always lain heavy upon our profession 
and the thought that by raising the topic of pre-colonial warfare in particular, one might be accused of presenting Africa's past as one of endless, mindless violence is one, I think, that has dissuaded many historians from approaching this topic. Characteristically, Richard took this head on. And in his work, consistently, time and again, he has shown that African warfare has not been primitive, that it has not been meaningless either. And also that it has not been simply driven by external demands for ivory and slaves, as some would like to argue. Richard has, as a reviewer put it in, his book of, in writing of his book on pre-colonial warfare in Eastern Africa, made war meaningful, if not rational, in African history. I think actually Richard might actually dispute the second part of that in that I think he would argue that warfare often is very rational, has been rational in the African past, because he is, while he has sought to explain it in terms of culture and explain its meanings culturally, he has also argued that for state actors, warfare has been a very rational and constructive approach to the pursuit of certain tasks. Although, of course, he has also shown how patterns of violence can repeat themselves destructively along historically enduring lines of conflict. Richard left Durham in 2007 while my back was turned, lured south, possibly by the attractions of working at, at SOAS, possibly by other reasons, who can say. We were extremely sorry to see him go, although I should say that the if we were sorry, the owner of Fabio's bar was absolutely desolate. <laughs> the move has, however, suited Richard in all kinds of ways. I think um, all his friends and colleagues will know that he has thrived here in a number of ways, and we have been pleased to see him thrive and pleased to see his family thrive. But also, of course, his scholarship has gone from strength to strength. Richard's written output has continued to be both prodigious and extremely readable. His publications and his engagement with a policy audience have confirmed his reputation as a scholar who is willing to pursue an unfashionable line of inquiry and make a difficult argument in a very clear and comprehensible way. For me, editing Richard's recent and now already much cited piece on pre-colonial history in the Journal of African History was a rare pleasure. It is not usual to come across a historian writing about African historiography, who can make one laugh out loud with the sheer boisterousness of their prose. And it was quite a pleasure to edit that piece. So Richard has continued to show himself not only willing, but actively determined to think across a long span of African history in explaining the African present, whether to undergraduate students or to diplomats or to other policymakers. Richard's performance as a lecturer on the Rift Valley Institute's Horn of Africa course is an absolute masterclass in how to make history relevant to a wider audience of policy makers. And also in how to switch between the grand regional overview and the very local insight and make the two cohere together in a single presentation. Richard is, in short, a scholar whose research insights whose gift for effective communication make him richly deserving of the recognition bestowed on him by the chair. And it is my very great pleasure to introduce my unusual, contentious, erudite, and provocative colleague and friend, Richard Reed. Wow, uh, I chose well. Um, thank you very much, Justin. Um, some of that is even uh, believable. Um, uh, just a quick couple of um, thanks um, to uh, various uh, family members, and there's, a, there's quite a few of them. Um, I feel a little like George Bernard Shaw tonight. Um, all relatives, no friends. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm exaggerating slightly. There are um, a number of uh, people I've managed to rustle up who I'm not related to tonight. So thank you uh, for coming. And uh, a, a couple of particular thank yous to my mum and uh, brother uh, who have come uh, rather further than uh, most uh, today. Um, 
now you might get a, an idea uh, of what I actually do. Um, and then you can judge for yourselves whether it's a sensible use of public funds. Um, and a special quick thanks to um, my wife, Anna, who I've lost, there she is, um, who deposited tonight our three-year-old in the care of a total stranger um, to be here tonight. Let's hope that works out. Um, Anna's uh, support, particularly uh, in recent months, um, has been absolutely invaluable and uh, I, I feel in some ways that the two of us are giving this inaugural lecture tonight although she may want to distance herself from that when she hears me uh, 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 after tonight. Um, Justin talked quite a lot about um, my work on uh, violence um, and I've decided to demilitarise. Um, I'm not going to talk about war tonight um, uh, although there is some political violence in this um, but rather uh, I want to take, uh, use this occasion to, to talk about a current project um, which is essentially an exploration of historical culture and consciousness. It's a new project, uh, well, it's been running, running around a year now. It's funded by the Leverhulme Trust, uh, very generously. Um, and the idea here is to explore the uses of the past, what history has meant in the making of modern African society and politics uh, using the case study of Uganda. I did begin uh, my uh, career in uh, Uganda uh, many years ago, well, 20 years ago, um, before moving up to the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and I've, I've since returned uh, to Uganda, largely because I can no longer get into Eritrea. Um, and Uganda, as I hope I will demonstrate, um, is, is a good place to test some ideas about the uses of the past and the importance uh, of, of history. So this project, which um, is in some ways quite simple, and yet in other ways terribly complicated, uh, is essentially about the role of the pre-colonial in uh, the making of a modern African uh, nation state. Um, and it has a long gestation uh, period. Um, it is, as Justin pointed out, um, I, I was a student here at SOAS, it's uh, 20 years uh, since I first showed up here um, to study under uh, Professor Andrew Roberts, who I'm very pleased to say is here tonight. Um, and I was uh, very surprised to discover that I was the only uh, student in my cohort who was doing pre-colonial history. Um, I ha had naively thought when studying as an undergraduate uh, at Stirling under uh, Professor Robin Law, who's also here, that pre-colonial history was African history. Uh, I didn't understand these people who did the 20th century, uh, which seemed to me to be basically politics. Um, so I've been thinking about this for quite a long time, um, and in a sense it's developed over the last two decades uh, the way in which the past, the African past has been increasingly foreshortened. Um, and as Justin pointed out in his uh, very generous introduction, there has been a trend towards uh, looking at the colonial period, and increasingly, in fact, the post-colonial period. Um, anything before around 1900 is increasingly regarded as largely irrelevant. Um, this is not to say it's completely dead in the water. It isn't. There's, there's a, a number of people working on the pre-colonial past, particularly uh, in North America. But it is still a minority sport. Um, and then there was the, um, my own experiences teaching, for example, in Eritrea for a number of years. Um, uh, it came to my attention just how fragile was the study of history, the teaching of history in a, in a young country like Eritrea. Uh, I was um, privileged to be part of the first um, BA degree program there. Uh, this was before the war with Ethiopia. Things were uh, looking good. Um, and then it quickly became clear, of course, that history was, was quite dangerous and, and uh, uh, very contentious. So my project um, is very, very broadly concerned with the way that history has been uh, 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 mobilized in Uganda over a number of decades, um, often cynically mobilized, um, and to explore the paradox that sat at the heart of the new nations of the 1960s, um, where, uh, in which you had a period where African history, of course, is born um, as a professional discipline, and SOAS is, is very much at the forefront of that. Um, and yet history becomes um, 
dangerous to those new, new nations, and this is particularly the case uh, in, in Uganda in, in various ways, as I hope to um, demonstrate. Uh, history and writing and talking about the past um, became a profoundly problematic uh, intellectual and uh, political uh, exercise. Um, I don't want to uh, keep you too long tonight. There's an excellent reception waiting for us, so let me uh, skip on. Um, and a further moment of inspiration, I have to say, um, in the Ugandan context came in uh, 2010 when I was there doing uh, exploratory uh, work for this, uh, this project. And I was very struck uh, by the story of the Uganda Museum, uh, this very uninspiring looking building uh, which lies uh, uh, on the uh, outskirts of the city centre in uh, Kampala. And um, essentially the story went that the government was, was determined to close the Uganda Museum. This, this particular building dates to the 1950s. Uh, it was originally, uh, I think, originally held at, at, at uh, Makerere University itself, which we'll come to later. Uh, the government decided that this museum was a waste of space. It occupies prime real estate uh, uh, on a hill uh, as you head north out of the city. It was going to close the museum, mothball the contents, and in its place it was going to build an East African trade centre, um, 30 storeys high or something. Um, and this struck me as, as uh, remarkable because um, in many ways it speaks to a very current concern, uh, certainly of mine and, and uh, one or two others in, in modern African uh, history and politics, which is a hostility to the past or aspects of the past. And uh, in the Ugandan context, a belief uh, increasingly that uh, things like history are frankly irrelevant. What matters is economic development, uh, uh, GDP growth rates, um, the past, however we choose to, dis uh, to, to identify it, and there will be various forms of history as I um, will show over the next half hour or so. History was associated with sectarianism, with tribalism, uh, and in fact was inimical to uh, uh, national development. And I think the current government uh, under the National Resistance Movement, the NRM, have very much uh, um, inherited uh, this idea from uh, earlier regimes, including Milton Obote, Idi Amin um, uh, in particular. So this was, uh, this was also a moment of uh, inspiration. Um, I have to say that the museum survives still. There was, a, there was an enormous uh, uh, um, outcry about this, and the government apparently has shelved its plans for the moment to close this uninspiring but incredibly important building. Um, so we wait to see what happens. Um, I should... Uh, say a word or two about uh, the Ugandan context itself for those of you who are um, un uninitiated uh, into the complexities of Uganda. Um, two pictures here. Um, the one on uh, my right is a rather uh, simpler view of, uh, of Uganda with uh, some of the key kingdoms, Buganda, Toro, uh, Kole, Banyoro, and the later addition of Basoga there um, uh, to the east. Um, the reality looks much more like the other one uh, on my left. Uh, Uganda is small but incredibly complex um, with uh, large numbers of uh, ethnic, cultural, linguistic groups uh, pressed in within uh, quite a small area. Uganda is small but incredibly complex. Um, my point being here that within this enclosed space uh, there's been enormous competition over the past enormous competition over what history means uh, uh, and what it might mean, crucially, of course, for the future. Um, I should say something also about uh, Buganda, Uganda. I, I have, I've um, tried to um, elaborate on this to several cohorts of students over the years. Uh, Buganda is not Uganda and vice versa. Uh, Uganda is uh, named after the kingdom that sits there in the centre, the south centre of, of the modern state. Uh, the British uh, basically misspelled it, as many others did, and the whole territory becomes known as Uganda, but in fact um, uh, it is named after that original kingdom. Now, Buganda, uh, as, as a, really an accident of historical geography, uh, looms large in our story. Buganda has one of the loudest voices. Uh, in Uganda, historically, uh, it, it uh, has an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily rich uh, literal and uh, oral output. So Buganda tends to overshadow all these other bits. Uh, 
my talk is very Gander-centric, um, but that's largely because um, uh, the project is in its early stages. Uh, if an academic wants to sort of get out clause, we always say uh, it's work in progress, don't criticize me yet. Um, but we are still looking at the various bits and pieces uh, around Buganda. But uh, much of what I have to say this evening is, con is concerned with Buganda, and we have to understand Buganda's hugely problematic dominant role in Uganda's um, 20th century. Much of um, what I'm dealing with in this project is concerned with the politics um, of the past, but I want to begin with something um, slightly different. Um, uh, an important aspect um, of this project is to examine the uh, representation of the pre-colonial past, for example, in Ugandan writing, Ugandan literature, itself uh, virgin territory very, uh, very much. Uganda, uh, even by contrast with neighboring Kenya, for example, is not, does not have a very big footprint uh, in uh, literary collections, for example. Um, but there are a number of uh, uh, important authors that um, the project is looking at. For example, this chap, Okot Betek, um, who uh, is described by some Ugandans not unproblematically as um, Uganda's Chinua Achebe. Um, and Okot belongs to a particular generation. He wrote uh, his early work in the 1950s at the same time as Achebe and, uh, for example, Kamara Ley uh, was writing in, in French Guinea, uh, pioneers of African writing. And these are probably his most famous uh, uh, works. Um, on, uh, uh, on the left here, Song of Luino, Song of uh, Achol, these are um, uh, traditional um, uh, formats. They are uh, presented in, 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 uh, in song form. Um, and it's basically, you have to read them sequentially. Uh, uh, Luino is uh, uh, a wronged woman uh, presented in, in this work as a, as a traditional woman with, uh, full of, uh, of uh, pre-colonial virtue. And Ochol is her fancy husband who has adopted Western ways and, and taken up with a, Western, a Westernized woman. Um, and they basically sing insults at one another. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful kind of breakdown of a marriage and, in fact, a culture uh, in, in, uh, in literature. And uh, White Teeth, uh, not, of course, I, I was, I was um, delighted to discover that Zadie Smith has obviously ripped off um, uh, the, a title of an Acholi novel uh, that was originally written in 1953, but was only translated uh, in the late 1980s. And uh, White Teeth, again, uh, if you want to read something uplifting uh, and, and about the resilience of the human spirit, do not read White Teeth. Um, <laughs> it makes Irish misery literature look positively um, Monty Python-esque. Um, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. It's absolute one misery after another. And um, it's basically the story of a young man who travels to Kampala from the rural north, tries to make a living, fails miserably, and returns um, having been robbed of his last possessions on the bus home. And that's where the novel ends. You know, there's, there's no, you're, you're kind of turning the page, waiting for something nice to happen. Nothing happens. It's all crap. Um, so he ends up going home. And of course, the whole story is basically uh, uh, as lots of uh, Achebe's work was and Kamara Ley in French Guinea. It was all about the, uh, the breakages of uh, supposedly pre-colonial uh, culture under the weight of um, colonial modernity. But it's not simply um, fictional writing. I, I, I also am quite keen to look at um, the burgeoning uh, realm of memoir in, uh, in Ugandan writing. And um, I couldn't uh, uh, let go of the opportunity to present uh, Princess Elizabeth of Toro, um, who was quite uh, prolific in her way, but her most famous book, of course, inevitably entitled African Princess. Um, and she was uh, famous in the 1970s for all sorts of reasons, some good, some not so good. Uh, she was, for a time, Idi Amin's foreign minister um, and uh, uh, came from royalty in the west of the country and ended up writing this memoir. And it's a very good example of uh, the packaging of a particular type, a vision of traditional society. Um, again, the project uh, uh, will be looking at this kind of thing. And indeed, the president of Uganda himself, 
Museveni has also gone into print. This is unusual. He, he doesn't normally look this grumpy. Uh, normally, normally, he's quite a smiley chap, although less so uh, uh, of late. Um, but Museveni has also written. Um, he's, very, he's become a very didactic uh, president. He likes to instruct, and he likes to instruct in print. And his own book, uh, his original book, Sowing the Mustard Seed, was, was very keen to kind of reach back to uh, a past that was, that's, full of, that's full of kind of virtuous peasants doing the right thing. So the project, in a sense, um, is not, is not uh, only about overt politics. I, I'm also very keen um, to look at this kind of literary um, output. But let me turn back um, a little bit to um, the early um, colonial period. And um, there are a number of experts in this audience um, uh, all I can do tonight is skip through particular episodes and, and, and give glimpses um, at the kinds of thing the project uh, is aiming to look at. Um, and we begin um, with the era of the scramble um, for Africa, uh, which I define as a period between the 1870s and the 1920s. Uh, this is a period where uh, thinking about history and historical production or cultural production with a historic, of a historical nature becomes incredibly content, uh, intense. Um, a new political marketplace is opened up as a result of the African-European uh, engagement. European imperialism um, provokes new ways of thinking about, about the past. Now, um, I've tried for quite a long time to argue that we should not be obsessed with the colonial period, and then in fact that in some places the colonial moment is largely irrelevant. Um, but there's no question that the coming together of, uh, uh, of European and African thinkers provokes new types of, of writing and thinking about the past. Again, Buganda, uh, which is represented in this, uh, um, in this uh, picture, the young king, uh, is over there on the left between the, the, the great kind of pillars of, of British society in the early Ugandan protectorate. Um, Buganda understood very well the advantages not simply of political engagement but of intellectual engagement, um, of putting their point of view forward, of, of producing histories that, that, were, um, that were meaningful and would create space for themselves, cultural and political space within which to operate. Historical writing was, above all, an imperial activity. So you get lots of stories uh, which are essentially, of course, uh, written in the style of the Old Testament. This was, of course, the first, uh, the first texts that many uh, baptized Christian Ganda had read. So they tended to write history in the style of, uh, of the Old Testament. Um, and lots of begatting and smiting and uh, indicating, of course, that uh, particular peoples were worthy of dominating over others uh, and so on. And this was very much an Afro-European exercise. Um, European writers were also complicit in the production of Ganda-centric visions uh, of the region's um, past. Um, this picture is of um, what remains, of course, one of the possibly still the finest public school in Uganda, uh, Bud uh, King's College Budo, which was opened in 1906. And here's the great and the good gathered, including, as I said, the young king uh, in 1906. And their output was very important in forging a new kind of uh, African history. And one of the earliest texts to come out of Budo school was um, the, uh, it was a book by the Reverend Weatherhead and Samson Buzongeri, which was called An Introduction to the History of the Entire World, um, three quarters of which dealt with Buganda. Um, so very much in the, in the style of, of British world history writing, where England, of course, is smack in the middle of uh, much of the narrative. So these, this was a period of history uh, in the making. And the particular characters that were involved in this, these will be uh, familiar to many people um, who uh, uh, know about Uganda. Uh, this, I think, is a particularly delightful uh, picture. Uh, this is Apolo Kagwa and uh, Ham Mukasa uh, outside Westminster Abbey on the occasion of Edward VII's coronation in uh, 1902. Uh, Kagwa's the one without the hat, like myself. Um, and his secretary, uh, uh, sorry, other way around. Kagwa is, is uh, wearing the hat, and his secretary is on his right, um, Ham Mukasa. Now, these were political heavyweights. Um, their literary endeavors, their writing of history, cemented their authority. Um, 
they seized uh, Kagwa in particular, dominated uh, a generation of historical writing uh, in Uganda, and of course uh, collaborated very famously with a church missionary society uh, missionary called John Roscoe. Uh, uh, they worked off one another. Occasionally they disagreed over particular interpretations, uh, but they were very much um, uh, in, in sync. And um, Kago was a very problematic figure. The, you, you, you had a later generation that, that basically grew up trying to kind of deconstruct everything that Kagwa uh, had ever written. But in the 1900s, particularly with uh, his Basa Kabaka Babuganda, the Kings of Buganda, which is basically a kind of chronicle, um, his, uh, uh, his uh, book on customs of Buganda, uh, the clans of Buganda, uh, extraordinarily um, um, prolific, all churned out on his own little uh, printing press. So this was a period uh, in which historical writing proliferates. Uh, clan histories get written. Um, the missionary societies themselves, and I should um, add something here, there is um, a, a, about the religious tensions, because of course, um, this was a, 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 a particular colonial territory that was split between Protestants and Catholics. Um, the Protestants got there first, they thought they had a, a virgin land in the 1870s, uh, and a couple of years later, the Catholics arrived. Uh, they were French, uh, which made it even worse. Um, some of the letters from missionaries are, are absolutely wonderful, uh, ranting about, you know, here, here we are in the, in the center of Africa. We've, 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 we've got a, a, a population ready for conversion, and along come these French Catholics and move just a mile down the road. Unbelievable. Um, they, made, they both made converts, and both churned out particular views of the past uh, uh, and sponsored particular newspapers. Abifa Mubuganda, for example. Uh, Abifa was the uh, CMS-sponsored uh, newsletter uh, from 1907. Uh, Muno uh, was produced, uh, you, which means your friend, uh, was the rival Catholic paper from 1911. And certainly by the 1920s, you're getting the appearance of vernacular newspapers um, often concerned with contemporary events, but very often with a great deal of uh, historical content, historical debates, the origins of particular kings and cultures and so on. Um, in, order, in other words, Ganda liked to see themselves in print. It was very important. It was politically important to get yourself into print, um, and history mattered. The pre-colonial past mattered, uh, because this was the, the best way that you could uh, make your point about the future, um, uh, the present and the future of, uh, of Uganda. Um, Buganda, again, in particular, has a flourishing uh, local publishing scene, and uh, writings take uh, various forms in this period. Um, lots of moral instruction, what uh, to do, what not to do in marriage, for example, uh, war memoirs, biographies, all of a uh, historical um, uh, bent. And one of the tensions uh, by the 1930s was the arrival of Western ways, um, in many ways, this, this, um, this anxiety continues, in fact, in, in Uganda today. And in some ways, for various reasons that some of you may be aware of, it's actually been reinvigorated um, to some extent. Um, and political heavyweights weighed in on this, including uh, the new uh, Kabaka. Kabaka simply means king of Buganda, uh, Daudi Chwa. Um, he was the small boy in the picture of the public school earlier. And Daudi Chua uh, weighs in on this and produces in the 1930s uh, pamphlets and, 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 and statements on the pre-colonial past, uh, including quite a famous one published in 1935, uh, Education, Civilization, and Foreignization in Buganda, uh, in which he basically talks about the beautiful, pristine nature of pre-colonial custom and behavior. He says there was no adultery uh, in, uh, in pre-colonial Buganda, um, only Europeans introduced um, sexual messing around. No human sacrifice. In fact, of course, there was not much human sacrifice under the British either, as far as we're aware. But uh, he, he, he felt keen to make the point that we didn't sacrifice one another, only very occasionally, and then they deserved it. Um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of personal respect, personal kindness. In other words, um, Daudi Chua, the, the king, looked out from, from uh, Mengo, which was uh, the, the, the royal palace, and saw all these, all these young dudes walking about dressed like the Europeans and, and began to despair that the pre-colonial past was being forgotten. And so history becomes a matter of um, morality um, and a reflection of generational conflict. There is, of course, uh, I'm told, 
a time in everybody's life when um, you begin to grumble about young people. Uh, obviously, I haven't reached that um, stage yet, and I can't quite understand how this happens. Um, but in uh, Uganda, you begin to get this by the 1930s. Um, Ham Mukasa, who we noted earlier on as, as uh, Kagwa's um, secretary, um, comes into his own in the 1930s. And many of his peers do the same thing, produce enormous tomes. The, these are men who are now uh, reaching their 50s, their 60s, and believe that they're being forgotten. Um, they need to remind these, these young bucks who've been born since the British came what they achieved in the late 19th century. And Ham Mukasa in particular uh, produces his monumental Samuda Numa, uh, which means don't turn back. It was a three volume history of the 19th century, culminating, of course, in the triumph of religious truth. Ham Mukasa was a, a good Protestant. Um, others weighed in at the same time. Uh, others talked about. Uh, and some of this stuff's quite um, uh, uh, bizarre uh, in, its, in its makeup. Um, kind of fusion of Gandhi culture with Roman Catholic mor mor morality, for example. But all of them um, deplored the new ways of drinking and marital infidelity and so on. And, and a lot of them focused as historical works on the turbulence of the late 19th century, the 1880s, 1890s, when this, this, this particular generation, Mukasa and others, had come to the fore and kind of rescued Uganda from, uh, from darkness. There's real, there are real comparisons to be made with other, uh, 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 with, with European examples of uh, in, in similar kind of generational shifts. Um, I couldn't give um, an academic lecture without showing you the front cover of a journal. This is about as exciting as it gets for um, academics. Um, well, this journal is actually quite exciting. This is, um, this is the Uganda Journal, and, and, and this is all, all another uh, major outlet for historical debate. This is um, volume one, number one, January 1934. Um, cost you a lot of money uh, on uh, eBay. Um, and this is a kind of fledgling academy. Um, the Uganda Journal is set up in 1934. This is, this is one thing the British did very well. Um, they, they, they promoted this uh, in most of their territory, certainly in, in our region, as far as I I'm aware in Tanganyika and Sudan and so on. And these were journals, um, if you look, if you can uh, see the top there, the organ of the Ugandan Literary and Scientific Society. Um, and they were full of, they were, they were kind of random notes about uh, the making of canoes or um, um, how to roast your bananas properly to keep your man happy. But they also had historical pieces and, and uh, this, is, uh, uh, this particular issue is no different. The, the, Fourth one down there is, uh, is a piece on Mutesa of Buganda, who was a big late 19th century uh, Kabaka. So you're beginning to get lots of outlets, both for Europeans and um, African writers. Now, much of this concerns Buganda. And um, of course, uh, one of the simple lessons that we're, we're uh, told about history is that it's usually written by the winners. Um, there are lots of losers in Uganda. We don't have time to go on uh, into all of them um, tonight. Um, but much of the output down to this point relates to Buganda, that, it, that was the favored, uh, they were the favored partner of the British. They were at the center of Ugandan colonial life in many respects. They regarded themselves, and this is important, as being undefeated. And this is still t true today. Uh, the Ganda do not believe that they were conquered by the British. They invited the British in, which is actually kind of true. But others didn't come out of it so well, uh, including this glum looking chap. Um, this is uh, Mukama or King uh, Kabalega of Banyoro. Banyoro um, made um, the decision to resist the British violently and um, uh, was, was uh, brutally crushed. And history writing and historical recollection in Banyoro takes a very different form, much more concerned with nostalgia and um, something lost, irreparably lost. Unlike Buganda, where history is very much alive and in the present and things to be debated over, Bonioro, uh, this was not true. He's also glum, of course, because he's just had his arm amputated. I should also say that. Um, so these cultures of defeat and nostalgia, um, one of the things we want to explore in the project is to look at uh, places like Bonioro um, <clears throat> and examine the ways in which that kind of history also got written. Um, the chap uh, on the right... Uh, is uh, 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 Tito Winyi, who was a later um, king of Bonioro. Here he is signing a, 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 an agreement with the British governor, Andrew Cohen, in 1955. Um, but 
uh, Winnie was very important in pushing a particular historical agenda uh, in Bonioro, including trying to get back territory that uh, the, the so-called lost counties that Bonioro had lost to Buganda in, in 1900. And in fact, uh, under a pseudonym, KW, um, this guy actually wrote a number of very important pieces for the Uganda Journal in the mid-1930s. And it, it's, he wasn't the first Nioro historian to go into print, but he was one of the most uh, important and ar articulate. And then, I'm afraid this is my worst uh, PowerPoint of the evening, uh, very hard to get a good snap of this chap, um, but John uh, Niakatura um, finally comes through in 1947 with uh, his major work, which is basically trying to match Buganda's earlier historical output. Uh, and uh, his book uh, was um, Abakama uh, by Bonyoro Katara, the kings of Bonyoro Katara, where he tried to kind of uh, re uh, um, uh, put Bonyoro back into the, uh, into the picture. Um, but through much of the colonial period, it's important to note that um, the British regarded Bonyoro as a kind of lost cause. Um, very uh, fatalistic, wrote a, a number of colonial administrators, um, and um, Bonyoro's prime minister told John Beatty, who was a prominent anthropologist in the early 1950s, our spirit is dead. Um, and many others find the same thing uh, in the 50s. The history is simply something that we tell by the, uh, uh, around the fire, uh, the fire at night, but we don't, you know, um, uh, uh, we've been separated from former glories. There are many other um, uh, losers, which we don't have time to go into tonight. Uh, Ugandan Muslims are a very important um, uh, area to go into. Um, uh, Ugandan Muslims, of course, um, had fewer uh, educational advantages from the 1900s. They were, they were late beginners. Uh, but even, by then, even among the Muslim community, by the 30s and 40s, you're beginning to get uh, uh, a Ugandan uh, Muslim historiography. Um, so history becomes ever more uh, politicized, and politics becomes ever more historicized uh, during decolonization. Um, and again, nowhere was this history politics vortex, if you like, uh, more turbulent, again, than, than in Buganda. And in many ways, the, the uh, debates, the arguments, the, 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 what becomes a, con a crisis is, is um, between these two men. On the right, in his robes, uh, the new Kabaka in 1939 um, becomes uh, king of Buganda, Edward Mutesa, Cambridge educated. And on the left, Milton Obote, uh, Milton Obote a Langi from the north. Um, and they represented very diverse uh, uh, traditions, cultures. Um, Edward Mutesa, of course, the king of one of the most uh, hierarchical states uh, anywhere in Africa. Obote, uh, a socialist um, from the north. Uh, which at that time, uh, at least, uh, lacked the same kind of monarchical tendencies. Um, and they clashed fundamentally over their visions of Uganda's past and therefore uh, its, uh, its uh, future. Um, there's lots more that could be said about the decolonization period, but it's worth noting, of course, uh, one development, which is the uh, emergence of Kabaka Yeka, uh, which means the king alone which became, for Buganda, a kind of ethno-nationalist movement. And, and one of their arguments was, in fact, secession from Uganda. Uh, their argument was, let Uganda uh, go hang. Uh, we are a pre-colonial kingdom of uh, incredible strength and, and cogency. We can, we can simply move on. And here's Edward Mutesa addressing all his, um, his, uh, his key figures. Um, and uh, this was, was often uh, regarded as, as neo-traditionalism. And, and the clash between northern, very broadly speaking, northern and southern um, uh, historical visions was stark um, in this period. Um, so this, this, this was the monarchical view that, that believed in the king and, and the king's things. The king was at the center of everything. Monarchy uh, was at the center. But it wasn't the only vision. Um, uh, probably the most famous figure, of course, in this picture is the one in the middle, Jomo Kenyatta. Um, but we're concerned with the one to his right, uh, ben Chowanaka, um, who was, in fact, Uganda's first prime minister, long forgotten in many ways, un under internal self-government. And Chowanaka was also uh, a Ganda, but he very much rejected the royalist monarchical uh, um, uh, movement and believed that Buganda had been strongest when it was open and more egalitarian, more democratic, and so on. So there were these alternative visions um, of the past. 
um, decolonization um, results in uh, a brutal historical revisionism, which is how I've chosen to interpret the abolition of the kingdoms. Um, eventually, uh, Milton Obote does actually abolish the kingdoms after working with uh, Buganda for a short few years in the early 1960s. They brought Uganda to independence uh, in 62. But by 1966, the kingdoms were abolished. And in many ways, uh, all political and cultural systems in which authority and identity were rooted in the pre-colonial past were deemed troublesome, divisive, anachronistic, uh, this was not the new Uganda uh, that, that uh, we wanted. And this is, this is uh, this rather grainy picture, is poor old Edward Mutesa uh, arriving, um, having walked hundreds of miles to get to Burundi, uh, where he sought um, um, asylum. Um, uh, if you notice, he always has a packet of cigarettes with him. Wherever, wherever he goes, Edward Mutesa has always got a packet of fags in his hand. Um, heavy, heavy smoker, and by all kinds a heavy drinker as well. And of course, he later died in London in 1969 under um, some say mysterious um, circumstances. So historical revisionism was very powerful in the political arena um, in the late 1960s. And um, this was continued in many ways by Idi Amin himself, um, who had a particular take on historical revisionism. Um, and I particularly like this picture of him being carried around by some poor Mzungus um, some poor white guys who uh, had chosen to remain in Uganda and, of course, had to take an oath of allegiance to him. He's a very big man. He must have weighed a bloody ton, but there he is uh, being carried around. If, if I was Idi Amin, I would have done exactly the same thing, quite frankly. Um, but Idi Amin has a particular uh, view of uh, a revisionist uh, approach. Of course, one of his titles, uh, uh, self-awarded, was Conqueror of the British uh, Empire. Um, and, of course, uh, most people have their own little Idi Amin stories. There are, um, uh, he also, of course, laid claim to the supposedly empty throne of Scotland. Um, he offered to marry that poor girl, Princess uh, uh, Anne. Um, he offered to take her off the Queen's hands. And uh, my particular favourite is that he offered to send uh, Ugandan peacekeepers to the troubled streets of Belfast. Uh, which <laughs> Um, that would certainly have made my childhood a little more colourful <laughs> than I remember it to be, at least. Um, so history was becoming dangerous. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot through this. Um, um, and yet, ironically, alongside these turbulent historical uh, or, or anti-historical dynamics in many ways in the political arena, arena, there is something of an historical revolution taking place in the professional academy. Um, this fine building is McCary University. And Makerere uh, University um, in Kampala was very much at the forefront of the new African history that was being born uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. Here, SOAS, uh, of course, comes into the story because, um, at least according to his own account, uh, my uh, illustrious predecessor as professor of African history here at SOAS, Roland Oliver, uh, was approached and asked if he would uh, go and, and, and save Makerere and, and, and rebuild uh, an African history department. He declined, um, but he certainly trained lots of the people who ended up going there. Um, the History of Uganda project uh, that was launched in the 1960s did amazing work and regarded themselves as part of a nation-building uh, project. Um, uh, 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 even though the history department at McCary remained largely white and male uh, until really the early 1960s. But, um, very much a historical revolution, just at the moment when political forces are kind of moving against uh, the past. Um, but to be a historian was um, a risky business, as those who worked under Idi Amin again, and there he is on, 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 one, on the one side, sort of looking like us with his robes. Of course, he was the chancellor of McCary for a time, and uh, on the left with all those medals that he basically uh, awarded himself. Um, and the, the expansion of the historical academy um, was largely brought to an end by the late Abote regime and then, of course, by Amin uh, in the uh, uh, early 1970s. And Amin uh, moved against Makari in, in sort of subtle ways uh, in many respects. Um, and his own view of, of history was, uh, was idiosyncratic. Um, in around 1974, 
uh, he complained bitterly to the powers that be at Macquarie that he heard that lots of students were doing their dissertations on the 19th century Arab slave trade. And he was very annoyed about this because he said, this will simply insult our Arab neighbours. He was, he was getting very close to Gaddafi at that point. And he instructed them to stop, you know, stop these students talking about the Arab slave trade. The slave trade was nothing to do with the Arabs. Um, and much more problematically, in 1976, he laid claim to the western half of Kenya, which was um, problematic, and instructed historians to find evidence in support of this. Um, and they promptly left the country. Um, so in many ways, um, this is a sort of historical uh, a, a, a crux, a, a critical moment. Um, Samora Machel, the president of uh, Mozambique, uh, had it, of course, in his oft-cited declaration, for the nation to live, the tribe must die. And increasingly, uh, the view in Uganda certainly was that the past was tribal, the future was national. And although these two gentlemen, Edward Matesa and Milton Abote, worked together for a number of years, uh, it clearly was, uh, was not sustainable in terms of uh, nation building, um, uh, nation building uh, projects. Um, and the historical academy itself, historians never quite overcame the ambiguity um, of the task um, uh, before it. Finally, uh, we move into the uh, modern periods and um, this is uh, the current president standing in the middle there, uh, Yoweri uh, Museveni. And in many ways, um, the nation is, certainly Museveni's views, the nation has been reborn under the uh, NRM. Um, they have restored order. They place emphasis on this to a great degree. The longer they've been uh, there, they, they've been there, of course, since 1986. And the emphasis now very much uh, is on how they have reconstructed um, Uganda. But they have inherited, in many respects, um, their, the morbid fear of the sectarianism of the past, of, of previous regimes. And in many ways, the, um, the best illustration of this problematic relationship uh, with the past is the government's relationship with Buganda. Uh, in 1966-67, the kingdoms are abolished, as I noted earlier. In 1993, they're restored. Um, but under the condition that they are not uh, political. Kings are not supposed to speak about political matters. These are purely cultural artifacts. But of course, kingdoms are not cultural artifacts. Uh, kingdoms are deeply rooted um, in all kinds of political history. And uh, until recently, at least, the relationship between State House, the president, and uh, the new king, Ronald Matebe, who used to sell double glazing in Kilburn, by the way, until uh, the kingdom was restored, um, has been very frosty. And in fact, the, the, the two of them have recently come to an agreement, uh, but for a long time, there were no relations between them. Um, you can understand that this is hugely problematic. You've got a kingdom sitting squat in the middle of the nation, uh, uh, and, and, and yet, the government feel, uh, can't actually talk to it in any meaningful way. And Buganda has been a problem, and, and I put it in inverted commas, of course, because for the, for the Ganda themselves, it's the government that's the problem. Um, but in 2009, for instance, um, uh, Museveni's attempt to restrict the role of the Kabaka uh, uh, produced uh, riots, um, which were very devastating. And then uh, in 2010, something very awful uh, indeed happened, uh, these are Kasubi tombs where um, uh, several of the uh, uh, former kings are buried. Uh, it's a UNESCO heritage site, and it went on fire in March 2010. It's been largely destroyed, um, and uh, the Ganda themselves believe that the government might have been behind it. Um, tensions really reached a, 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 a low at that point. Um, so these struggles go on. History very much matters. These, these are battles over the very heart of what Uganda means. And, and in many respects, um, Ugandans, of course, view their kings with some skepticism, but they view central government with even greater um, uh, skepticism. So the NRM, the, the, the Museveni's government and uh, Buganda sort of uh, wades their political wars, Terminator style, uh, wrestling back into the past over things um, that they think affect the future. Uh, Museveni, for example, uh, is very keen to go around championing the causes of smaller groups that he, say, uh, he says were incorporated into Buganda in the late 19th century and encouraging them to become independent. 
uh, clearly enraging the Ganda. Uh, 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 this is clearly an attempt to um, undermine Buganda's reach. These are uh, history wars. When Museveni was uh, a student himself at Dar es Salaam in the 1960s, he was a very keen student of history. But he's come not to see it uh, in quite those terms. The post-colonial state has become, under him at least, uh, extremely uh, disinterested in and, in fact, uh, hostile towards the past. Um, he has made speeches where he's instructed parents not to let your children go and study useless subjects like history. Um, lecturers themselves at McCary, which has recovered to some extent, but lecturers themselves bemoan the fact that students often don't want to study history. There's no money in it. This is true. Um, <laughs> Um, they see it as irrelevant, you can't make money, they study business, development. In fact, there are uh, uh, cases where uh, history departments have toyed with renaming themselves the Department of Development Studies or uh, poli politics and history, very small, politics and history. Um, and in fact, across the city, you get the, the, the uh, uh, growth, enormous growth in uh, these new universities such as this. They all kind of look like this. They've all got this kind of blue, shiny uh, glass front. This is Victoria University, which is in fact just on the road up to the uh, museum. And uh, they, don't they don't teach history. Uh, there are many of these new universities, but they all do business studies, management studies, um, that kind of thing. They might do uh, some politics, but always with a kind of uh, uh, an emphasis on um, political economy. Universities, uh, uh, Museveni has uh, announced, um, are only of value in what they contribute to Uganda PLC. Uh, history doesn't contribute anything. What we need are economists and so on. And if all this sounds familiar uh, in this country, um, that's because it is. Uh, hence the picture of the hapless uh, Andrew Mitchell, uh, when of course he was uh, development secretary out there. This in fact is uh, him and Museveni on a visit to Victoria University um, a few years ago. Um, uh, and again, um, the UK government has very much encouraged this idea that, yeah, you're right, you know, history is largely meaningless. Get your students studying economics and development and, and so on. Well, um, I don't want to uh, end with a picture of Andrew Mitchell. <laughs> Sorry. So here's a monkey. Um, but a very important monkey um, because um, this, of course, is the kind of thing that most people go to Uganda to see. I have never seen uh, a Ugandan gorilla. I am very proud of this fact. I, I don't quite understand why people go to Africa to look at animals. It's beyond me. Um, so here we have a, an income-generating gorilla, and Museveni is interested in income generation, not uh, in the past. What I hope um, I've demonstrated tonight, or surveyed at least in the most superficial of terms, the troubled history of history uh, in Uganda. Um, the vitality of the pre-colonial past versus the perils of actually studying it or seeking to root um, identity in it. We might consider, of course, that there are indeed more important things in contemporary African society, um, medicine, food, employment, infrastructure. Um, in Western Europe, after all, um, professional historians uh, are uh, an outcrop of um, a, a relatively affluent society in the late 19th century. And yet ideas about the deep past have long been central to how Ugandans thought in political terms. Um, the government might think that people and their histories get in the way of construction and growth. But this kind of developmentalism has been very narrowly defined and increasingly so. Um, and this increasingly ominous authoritarianism, uh, I think, is altogether more dangerous, potentially destructive than the histories uh, from which Ugandans apparently need to be protected. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you, everybody. Richard, a gorilla is an ape, not a monkey. <laughs> but let's move on. <laughs> it remains for me as Richard's colleague, friend, and collaborator here in the African history section of the Department of History at SOAS to bring the formal parts of this evening's proceedings to a close. First of all, I'd like to thank those who have contributed to making this inaugural lecture such a memorable occasion. Payal Gaglani Bhatt, who has organized the event, Paul, for his customary graciousness as our host, and Justin, for coming down from Durham and giving us such an engaging introduction. Thank you all. Richard, it gives me huge personal pleasure to congratulate you on your professorship and to thank you for giving us such a vivid insight into your work. I'm aware that the customary way of undertaking a vote of thanks is pithily to encapsulate the essence of the inaugural lecture, somehow recapitulating its salient points and broad intellectual thrust, something along the lines of a discussant at an academic conference. When a lecture or a paper has been presented in such a way as to make large swathes of it incomprehensible to its audience, this is surely a useful and laudable exercise. When, however, as I think we've experienced tonight, a talk is characterized by a fine balance between erudition and accessibility, then I think restating its key ideas seems somewhat redundant. I therefore have no intention of doing so. What I wish to do instead is very briefly to reflect upon where this display of scholarship that we've just witnessed, and I can't really think of a better way of putting this, comes from. I do not mean individual genius, although of course this plays a role in the process of any intellectual production. Rather, I mean something that at least on the surface appears somewhat more prosaic, and that's training. The notion of training, intellectual training, the process by which a disciplinary craft is learnt, and you've touched on this in your lecture, leads us, moreover, I think, to the matter of intellectual genealogy. And it strikes me that genealogy is what the ceremony of the inaugural lecture is at least in part about. That is, by celebrating achievement with the conferring of a professorship, it marks the passing of the scholarly baton from an older to a younger generation. A chair in the history of Africa here at SOAS has itself considerable historical resonance. And that's a point worth thinking about as the school approaches its centenary in 2016-2017. <coughs> as we've heard from Richard and has touched on by Justin, Richard came to SOAS to do his PhD on the history of Buganda under the supervision of Professor Andrew Roberts in the early 1990s. I was already here writing my own PhD thesis, as was Justin, hence the rather matching suits we're all wearing tonight. <laughs> my supervisor was Professor Richard Rathbone, who would succeed Andrew Roberts as the head of the African history section on the latter's retirement in 1998. Roberts and Rathbone, along with Michael Brett, who's also joined us tonight, were key members of a cohort of historians recruited in the 1960s and 1970s by someone Richard mentioned towards the end of his talk, Roland Oliver, a doyen of the modern field of African history in this country. And I use the word doyen with no exaggeration. The lectureship in African history at SOAS, to which Oliver was appointed in 1947, was the first such position in a university in the UK, or as far as I know, anywhere else. Now, on the way down here tonight, I ran into Ian Brown, our dear colleague who's busy writing a history of the school for its centenary. And he reminded me that in 1947, Roland Oliver's position was called a lecturer in the pre-colonial tribal history of Africa. And that, I think, tells us a lot 
in the context of what Richard's given us as to how things have changed and what has been achieved in those passing generations. Quite simply, African history as a recognized part of the broader discipline simply did not exist before this time. In terms of our genealogy, just two generations back. In 1960, Oliver co-founded the Journal of African History, which remains the leading periodical in our field and which Richard now edits. Oliver's subsequent professorship in 1963, 50 years ago on the nail, was therefore not simply a personal honour, but a recognition on the part of SOAS, despite ongoing resistance from some quarters, Justin noted Hugh Trevor Roper in passing, that the study of the African past from an indigenous African rather than a colonial perspective was a legitimate and viable scholarly endeavour. Neither was this project one that remained within these walls. As Richard's shown us, Oliver and his colleagues also trained many of the first generation of African historians, who after attaining their PhDs returned to newly independent nations to found history departments in universities such as Legon, in Ghana, Ibadan, in Nigeria, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and Makerarene University in, um, in uh, Uganda, where Richard uh, is now affiliated, as we've heard, for his ongoing project. Indeed, Richard's own role in helping to establish the teaching of history in the University of Asmara until South Sudan came along a few years ago, Africa's last nation state to achieve independence, but from an indigenous imperialism rather than a European one, can be seen as a late flowering of such scholarly collaboration. SOAS then was a real pioneer in our field, and Richard's predecessors as professors of African history were its pioneering frontiersmen and frontierswomen. These remain names to reckon with. They might be usefully likened to what in the Savannah kingdoms of South Central Africa are remembered as culture heroes, valiant and virile figures possessed of mysterious new technologies who crossed rivers from the east to defeat unjust, drunken, and often incestuous rulers, to marry their sisters and thereby carve culture from barbaric nature. An analogy, at least in some of its elements, withstands some scrutiny. Now, like all epics of origin, such accounts comprise a mixture of historical truth and self-serving mythology. With regard to my own theme of genealogy, my sketch is immediately complicated by the fact that whereas my supervisor, Richard Rathbone, was trained by Roland Oliver, Andrew Roberts was trained by an equally Ur figure, Professor Jan Van Sina, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison where North America's pioneering program in African history was established in the wake of that here at SOAS. As we're delighted to welcome Andrew back with us tonight, I'll leave further elaboration on these matters, should he so see fit to him. Now, my point is neither to air the Oedipal anxieties of the history department, nor to suggest that our newly appointed professor of African history need carry this heavy burden on his young but reasonably well-formed shoulders. <laughs> it's simply to remind us that what he has achieved and what we as a school continue to represent is part of a longer story, and I think one we can be very collectively proud of. Richard, many congratulations for delivering to us this evening a wonderful lecture. Thank you all for coming. And before we repair upstairs for the reception, can I ask you to join with me once more in applauding Richard's wonderful achievement. Thank you very much. <laughs>